All right, so today I think I'll talk mainly about lattice gauge theory. Okay. Um, I should have given this talk at 4 and had Grady talk at 5.30. That would have made a great deal more sense. But unfortunately, um, we had it scheduled the other way around. Okay. Um, so, let me... start by explaining uh, Wilson's action. Um, and it's, it's quite a cute thing. Um, the idea is that on, we'll have a lattice like this, and on each link we're going to put a group element, an element of the gauge field. And the element of the gauge field will be in, the way I did it was e to the minus i, g the coupling constant, a the lattice spacing, a, and it would be a, uh, let us say, a mu for the muth, if this is the muth direction, that's the nuth direction, it would be like that. Okay, so the link, the, what we have here is a, a lattice in four dimensions. In other words, uh, points separated by a lattice spacing A and uh, all the links are perpendicular and um, from each vertex, you have links going in four positive directions because it's uh, four-dimensional. And um, on each link, you put uh, a structure like this, where a mu is um, a sum of generators times gauge field. That's the way I think of it. The way um, most people, uh, the way Wilson wrote it, and the way it's um, stand, uh, the standard way of writing it is just to call that u mu. Okay, because that's certainly a unitary matrix. These t's are permission, the a's are real. Um, let's um, take the center of the plaquette to be, uh, let us say, x. And um, the Wilson's action then for the plaquette is beta, and um, beta is, one can think of it as an inverse temperature or as an inverse squared coupling constant. Anyway, it's some real number uh, awaiting. And then this is 1 minus 1 over n real part trace. And now, e to the minus i g a, well, little a, times a1 of x minus a j over 2, um, where i and j are um, uh, unit vectors. Um, so in other words, we've got this, uh, let's see, if, if this is the one direction, let us, let's call this one and this two. Then we go and we'll call this direction i and that direction j, say. Then um, the, the center of this link is x minus a j hat over 2, effectively. So i and j, uh, j, i and j are unit vectors in the, these two directions. And then the next one will be e to the minus i g a a2. And now this one is x plus i a over 2.
And then the next one is, now the next one, we're going backwards. So instead of i, we have, instead of minus i, we have plus i. e to the i g a a1 of x plus a j over 2. Notice here, the center of this thing is x plus a j, whereas on the first one it was minus. And then the next one is e to the i g a a2 x minus a i over 2. And then we close the trace. And then we have the curly brackets. So that's the Wilson uh, action. N is the dimension of the representation. So these T's at TA's is uh, an N by N matrix. And of course, it's equal to. Uh, T, well, I call it the T lower A, T lower A dagger, the cross emission. All right, now, the, here's what's, um, what's interesting. Of course, in the abelian case, let, let me just digress a little bit here. In the abelian case, what we have, what we would have, is we can imagine doing something like this, E to the I, integral of a mu dx mu around, in fact, forget about the, the e to the i, let's just say we do this. By Stokes' theorem, this is equal to uh, f mu nu, in other words, or effectively, it's integral of um, b dot ds. Okay. In other words, the, the, the integral of a mu around the surface is the is the or let's put it this way is the same thing as the integral of the curl of a dotted into the surface where this loop is the boundary of the surface. For some reason, mathematicians write that as boundary of s. So the integral of the curl of A over S is the same thing as the integral of A around the boundary. Okay, so what we would have then in the Abelian theory is we would be able to say that E to the I integral uh, A mu dx mu was the same thing as E to the I integral uh, F mu nu, uh, well, let me call it D sigma mu nu whatever the surface is, okay? The surface surrounded by the loop. And um, now, unfortunately, the non-abelian version of this thing um, has, is either complicated or obscure. I don't know of a, there are papers that talk about it, but it looked pretty, it looked pretty, uh, complicated, so I'm just going to skip it. From the point of view of of Wilson's uh, lattice gauge theory is that the idea for small a, you can still do this in the non-abelian case. So Wilson's trying to get the, I guess, gradient inside the cell by going around the edges. Of the curl. Well, I mean, because this was the action is, is, is like, you know, is the uh, Lagrangian. Yeah, yeah. Right. And well, so he's. he's well, right, he, well, 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 what we, know, what we know is that the actual action is an integral of a quarter f mu nu. In fact, if we're in Euclidean space, it's just f mu nu squared d fourth x. Okay. All right. And um, the point. All right. Let, let me get to to what you are saying. Suppose we can say that e to the integral e to the i integral a mu dx mu 
is, in some approximate sense, at least for small moves, is an inter is e to the i f mu nu d sigma mu nu. Okay. Yeah. Now, let's uh, approximate this. What is this? Well, it's one plus i integral f mu nu d sigma mu nu, and then minus integral f mu nu f mu nu d sigma mu nu d sigma mu nu. And now if you take the trace, you get n from this term. These generators are all traceless for most of the groups that one talks about. So this vanishes. And this gives you uh, uh, f, the trace of f mu nu squared. Okay, times a certain area, which um, times a certain area squared. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do, so, so that's the basic idea. And moreover, you've got a, a gauge invariance here. If you have an integral of a around a closed loop, that's a gauge invariant. It's obviously gauge invariant in the abelian case, and it's less obviously gauge invariant in the non-abelian case. And um, so then this whole thing is gauge invariant, and here you have an explicit gauge invariance in the sense that you can put, you can put at each vertex of the plaquette, in other words, here, 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 and here, you can make a gauge transformation. And the, uh, the idea here is the following, that the gauge transformation on link one will be, um, say, u, and the first, that thing is u, uh, let us say ui, because we said it was the i direction, u inverse, but now on uj, we make the gauge transformation u, and so this is 1, this is 0.2. Okay, so we have 1, u1, u2, u2, u3 inverse, and then we have u, um, this would be the other ui. So, in any event, whatever it is, it's some other, I'll call it uh, i prime. And then this would be uh, u3, u4 inverse. And um, then we would have uj prime, uh, u4, u1. And now if you take the trace of this whole thing, you see it is invariant because these guys cancel in a trivial way and then the u1 cancels with the, the well that should have been a u1 inverse the u1 inverse the u1 cancel because the trace is cyclic and so then this is the same thing as the trace of ui uj ui prime uj prime where um, so that's that's the idea that you have that, that you have a perfect uh, what Wilson did was construct an action that has a perfect gauge symmetry and um, and moreover in the limit a going to zero looks just like the Euclidean action and now let me show you why it is that this uh, works works out um, to do that, I'm going to use what's called the, well, it's a certain identity. It's called Baker Hausdorff by some people. Little a times a, e to the little a times b. This is approximately e to the little a times a plus b, uh, plus a squared over 2, the commutator of a with b. And um, then plus higher order terms, of course. Now, 
there's a special case of this which Glauber proved a long time ago, which is that if A and B both commute with their commutator, then this is an exact relation. You don't need any extra terms. But um, in this non abelian uh, situation, uh, all we have is something that's approximate. But on the other hand, um, we're, we're imagining things in the limit A going to zero anyway. So let's uh, take the product of the first two here. So this is um, e to the minus i g a a1 of x minus a j over 2 e to the minus i g a a2 of x plus i a over 2 i being that unit vector and so this is approximately e to the minus i g a times a1 of x minus a j over 2 plus a2 of x plus a i over 2 minus i g a a1 of x a2 of x over 2. Now, well, that's a commutator. This is the right bracket for this exponential. Now, let me uh, mention something here. Here, we have one factor of A, and, um, and I kept this. But over here, you see, what we've got is a, a commutator. And um, I'm neglecting the, um, the extra a over 2 there. And the reason is that it, it, it's effectively of order. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. It's obvious, isn't it? It's that since we have a appearing quadratic, we really have two a's here. So if we also kept the a there, we would have order a cubed. So we can drop the x. Um, what about the uh, the other two? These two. Well, similarly, what we get is e to the i g a one of x plus a j over two e to the i g a a two of x minus a i over two. This is approximately e to the i g a well let's put the i g a there and then the bracket um, a1 of x plus a j over 2 plus a2 of x minus a i over 2 and then minus i g a a1 of x comes here of x divided by 2, big right bracket. Okay. And um, I, I've also kept track of the i's and the g's here. Okay, now we have to multiply this times that, with this on the left and then that. And now to order a squared, what that is, is, so the total product, I'll just write pi equals e to the minus i g a squared, big left bracket, a2 of x plus a i over 2 minus a2 of x minus a i over 2. So notice that with a2, we've got a plus a i over 2. That's this one. And then over here, we have a2 of x minus a i over 2. OK? So that's why these guys uh, come in. And the, 
I'm a little puzzled as to where the that a squared came from. Uh, oh, I divided by a. So I pulled out an a squared, divided by a, and this is going to turn into a derivative. Yeah. I guess you know that. Okay. The next term, just keeping track, is a1 of x plus a j over 2 minus a1 of x minus a j over 2 over a. Okay, and um, you see that a1 comes in with, with, with the minus comes in with a plus and it gets a plus there. And then down here, a1 has a plus and it comes in with a plus. I mean, coming in with a minus there. Um, no, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got a minus. <clears throat> oh, we have a minus out there. Okay. Thank you. What would I do without the students? Uh, does anybody else ask? Has anyone else asked a question and not gotten a candy? Okay. So we have that, and then what do we have? Well, we have two commutators, and we don't have to be very careful about them. We just have minus i g a1 of x commutator a2 of x. And then big right bracket. Okay, well now you see what this is. This is um, e to the minus i g a squared f12 of x because we and, and and what are we what is the convention that I'm using? Um, I'm using the convention that um, f12 in the continuum of x is d1 a2 of x minus d2 a1 of x minus i g a1 of x times a2 of x. So as you know, there are many, many different conventions for, well, there are two conventions for any f you knew you, uh, it's either plus or minus. And um, if this is it, then the approximate f12, then, well, it's just exactly this, namely it's, it's the derivative in the i direction of a2, which is a derivative in the one direction, effectively, of a2, minus the derivative in the two direction of a1, and then minus ig, the commutator of the two. And these guys, these a's are always um, uh, the, you know, the a is t little a, a, uh, a say, so t. it's like that. Okay, so what we see then is that this trace, the trace in, uh, we can call it the Wilson trace, is, um, so trace, uh, what do we call it? Uh, U1, U2, U1 prime, U2 prime. This thing is e to the minus i g a squared, the f12, a lattice version of f12, where f12 is this big thing inside the square brackets. And um, now, oh, times the tra it's trace. We still have a trace here. And now if we take that trace, well, it's 1 minus i g a squared f12 um, minus g squared a to the fourth f12 uh, squared, and then higher terms. And so the first term is n. This is traceless because uh, f mu nu itself is a, uh, well, if we just look at it here, the a's are linear combinations of generators. 
And as you know, the commutator of a linear combination of generators with another linear combination of generators just gives you structure constants times linear combination of generators. And so it's all together, everything is a linear combination of generators. And all the generators are traceless for any of the S groups, S-U-N, S-O-N, whatever. And uh, so this trace is zero. And the next thing is minus G, G squared A to the fourth trace of F12 squared. And, um, the, and, and so now if we take the, the Wilson action, what we had was beta 1 minus 1 over n, uh, the real part of this trace of uh, e to the minus i g a squared, let us say f12 for that particular uh, plaquette, then this is beta times 1 minus, and now we divide by n, we get a 1 uh, plus g squared a to the fourth over n uh, trace of f12 squared. And so this is all together then um, beta g squared a to the fourth trace f12 squared. And we're thinking uh, Euclidean here. Um, and the, and uh, then there was an n. And if we want to just sum over mu and nu without, and, and count 1, 2, and 2, 1, or both of them, then we put in an extra 2. And uh, we sum over. So in other words, this goes to, uh, let us say, now we just sum over all mu news if um, we're thinking that way. I don't, I don't quite know why one would do that, though. It would seem to me more natural to forget about the two, because with a given plaquette, you, um, there's no need to do the plaquette twice. So the two, if you want to, so if you want to sum over both of them. Okay. So now, what is the continuum action? Well, the continuum action is uh, beta g squared over two n integral a half trace f squared mu nu d fourth x. And here, one does sum over repeated indices. That's why you have the two. Okay, so you want to sum over 1, 2, and 2, 1, then you divide there, because you, the convention is sum over repeated indices. Um, and, uh, okay, so that's, um, that's basically what, um, that's what the Wilson action is, and as I said, it has this, um, gauge invariant property which um, is very nice. Um, on the other hand, it has a defect which um, various people have noticed at various times and the defect is that um, how shall I say, the Okay, the Wilson action, the, the key thing in the Wilson action is the trace of the link, the trace of the unitary matrices around the plaquette. The problem is that if the trace of this thing, if, if the product, I should say, now in the abelian case, if you have an e to the 2 pi i coming about from this, that's a pretty big phase, but it's equal to 1, and so it doesn't count. Okay. And uh, as 
And so that's the real reason why the, the U1 theory um, converge, uh, uh, confines of strong coupling. And it's, that, oh, well, I didn't tell you what the confinement signal is. I think I should do that maybe in a, uh, in a minute. But the point is, there's, if we're talking about the continuum theory, um, and in the continuum, if, if we went to the continuum limit, we would have integrals of uh, e to the i, well, we would have simply f mu nu squared. And so, if the gauge fields are big, this f mu nu squared could be big. And so, the penalty would be e to the minus uh, the action uh, times whatever your beta is, e to the minus beta s. And so, for big a's, f is big, f squared is big, and so you get a very small probability in the path integral. The problem is that in Wilson's formulation, there are some a's that don't count and are big. And, and so in particular, suppose you have an a, suppose you have, a, again, to go to the abelian case, suppose you have a bunch of, in the abelian case, these are all just phase factors. And if the product of the phase factors is such that it's e to the 2 pi i plus i epsilon, well then the penalty is very little, whereas the gauge fields could be quite big. Now sometimes these gauge fields that are quite big are themselves some big gauge fields give zero f mu nu. These are so-called pure gauge fields. In other words, you take a gauge trans... After all, here, what, what happens under a gauge transformation? A mu prime is u d mu u inverse, essentially. So it is u a mu u inverse plus u d mu inverse and um, let's see I was going somewhere but I've lost my train what was I talking about what was I gonna I was getting to a point and I've forgotten because I went up I went off to explain that you want to explain sometimes F mean you become zero all right all right thank you I owe you a candy the pure gauge configuration is a prime mu equals u d mu u inverse. So in other words, the act of the, we start out with an a that's act identically zero, and it's just u d mu u inverse. That's called a pure gauge. You write it down in case uh, Ms. de Blasio is watching pure gauge. Okay, so I owe you a candy. <clears throat> so if A is a pure gauge, then F mu nu is zero. So you, there are some big A's, in other words, which should not be penalized because they're just pure gauges. But on the other hand, there are many others that um, are not pure gauges, that aren't penalized because of the, uh, because even the two by i is one or because something else is one. And um, so I've been suspicious, therefore, of the Wilson action for many, many, well, 30 years almost. And, uh, Grady apparently has gotten to the bottom of this, uh, or at least the top of it, and um, uh, seems to be showing that um, that that 
this lattice art these lattice artifacts are providing the confinement signal in uh, Wilsonian lattice gauge theory. Now let me show you um, let me show you uh, what um, what the confinement signal actually is. And this has to do with what's called uh, the Wilson line and the Wilson loop, which actually was behind the Wilson action. Almost everything starts with the word Wilson here. Um, Okay, um, let me in fact go back, and let's go back all the way to mechanics. Suppose we have a force field, and, and in fact, forget about time, let's just think about space. Suppose we have a force field, okay. Now, can we write this force field as minus the gradient of some of, of some v of x? Well, yes and no. <laughs> and what we can do is this. We can say, okay, I'm going to define v of x this way. It's going to be um, an integral from the origin, say, up to the point x of um, minus whatever the force happens to be, x prime dot dx prime, okay? So it's some line integral. And uh, what then is the gradient of this thing? Well, the gradient of v of x, of course, is in a sense, it's minus f of x because you just differentiate here and you just get that. But there's a subtlety here because you see this is a line integral, so it's along some contour. So in fact, this thing really isn't v of x, it's v of x times some, some l along which you integrate the contour. So when you take this gradient, and you change x, you change the contour also. So it really isn't true that this is the case, because you change the contour. All right. Now, when, when does this work? Well, it works when the contour doesn't count. When does the contour not count? Well, the contour doesn't count. If you go from the origin to point x, if you go this way or that way, you get the same answer. Okay? But what does that mean? That means that the integral of f x prime dot g x prime equals zero. In other words, the loop of that is zero. And of course, by Stokes' theorem, this is the integral of the curl of f over the surface, where this is the boundary of the surface. And so you get this if the curl of f is zero. So that's what you learned in mechanics. And the reason why um, you don't, why you can't do this for arbitrary force fields is that it looks as though you can do it, but you've got a hidden contour here. And so when you take the gradient, you change the contour, and so you get an extra term. Unless the curl is zero. All right. Now, we can think, uh, suppose we wanted, um, not this equation, but suppose we wanted something such that d mu, and I'll call it w of x, equals, say, i a mu of x w of x. 
some things. Well, we can do this. If um, we say W is e to the i integral a u d x u, and in fact we could define something called W of x and y to be integral from y to x of that. And, um, but now, once again, I'm a little leery about taking derivatives there because, again, there'd be, this, there'd be a path ordered term unless the curl of A vanishes, which is to say, unless uh, F mu nu vanishes. And then there's no electromagnetic fields at all. But nonetheless, we can define this, and this is called a Wilson line. So if you write it correctly, This Wilson line, then, is an integral. In the abelian case, it's simply an integral from y to x along some specified contour. Uh, what happens in the gauge transformation? Well, in the gauge transformation, in the abelian case, you get a mu prime of x is simply a mu plus, um, well, u d mu u inverse, but u is equal to e v i alpha. It's simply a u1. Okay, U1 being a unitary. Uh, and um, the generator here has a trace because it's just the number one. Um, and so what would this be? This would be A mu uh, plus I uh, D mu alpha. And then the phases cancel. Are you okay? Uh, Minus, don't the frown in. Uh, okay. Okay. So, in other words, u du inverse is e to the i alpha, du to the minus i alpha, so e to the i alpha, and then this is um, minus i alpha common mu, or d mu alpha. Even minus i out, but the out is canceling. So that's what we've got here. So then, under a, an abelian gauge transformation, this Wilson loop is e to the i integral along L from y to x, and it's uh, a mu minus, well, okay, there's a, 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 a bit of a problem here, namely that this, we don't need an I. See, normally I define the connection with the I and the gauge field. In that case, we don't need an extra I there. And so it's just and now what is the change in this Wilson line? Well, it's the order it's the ordinary Wilson line, namely e to the integral y to x, a mu dx mu. But now what we have is e to the i alpha of y, e to the minus i alpha of x, because the integral of d mu a mu dx mu along the contour, no matter where, no matter what the contour is, is alpha of minus alpha of x. Uh, plus alpha of y. And I just put them at one end of the other because I wanted to be able to write it this way. of e to the integral a mu 
dx mu. And now these are, in other words, this is p, e, and the way the notation I used there was a was minus ig. You can just as well take i, g, a, and then all the formulas change a little bit with minus signs, but it's the same basic thing. So minus i, g, integral, t, a, a, mu, t, x, mu. So this is path ordered in the sense that if we're going from y to x along some contour, then the little bit, in other words, it looks like this, e to the minus i, g, epsilon, t, a, 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 mu of y, and then e to the minus i, g, uh, epsilon, t, a, 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 mu, I guess it's mu, uh, y plus epsilon or something, you see. In other words, you, you, do, you slice it up like in a path integral into a gazillion slices, you know, like doing bologna at a cheap sandwich shop. Um, <laughs> you slice it very thin, and uh, the slices, the, the parts of the contour that are at near, the, near y go over here, near x go over there. Then, under a gauge transformation, you can show trouble is I don't have a really, I don't quite have a nice proof of this. I, but let me just tell you what the answer is. W prime of x bar L is u of x w x y L in inverse of y. So under the gauge transformation, it's effectively just like in the abelian case. Um, but it differs in that the, the line itself not only depends upon the contour, but on that contour, the um, bologna slices are path ordered. Now you can see what, what motivated uh, Wilson, namely, that if you consider something W prime x x l, in other words, or equivalently y y l. Maybe I should have done that. Well, this one transforms how? It would be u of y, w y y l, u inverse of y. Now, it's not gauge invariant, but it does have a very nice property. It transforms in a way such that if you took the trace of W, of Y, Y, any loop, this thing is the same thing as the trace of W, Y, Y, L. So the trace of a Wilson line that's closed is gauge invariant. And now, what Wilson did was to do on the lattice the, the, the simplest, neatest approximation to the closed Wilson loop. And that's just this plaquette thing. Is there a question? Yeah, um, for the abating case, W prime is U, W, U, no, it's W prime is U inverse W, U, right? Yes. But yeah. Now that you mention it, in, in, in this notation, it is U inverse. Yes. And um, so, but of course, it depends on what you mean by U inverse. If you take the inverse transformation, then it's U U inverse. So, all right. Let me give you a candy. And let's see what else. I should uh, talk about, boy, I'm getting low on candy. Uh-oh, there's only one left. All right, so let me invite questions. Um, are there any 
I, th I think if there are any questions, we ought to get them out of the way, and then I might say a little more. So how is the Wilson? So we talked about Wilson lines. So a Wilson line links to the potential, which then links to confinement. Oh, you want to see confinement? Well, no, I just wondered how the Wilson line. We started with talking about potentials and forces, and we got to Wilson lines. Oh, well, the forces over here was just to say that, um, just to say that uh, you can define something like this, but it depends on the contour. Right. That was just. I wasn't trying to go at confinement from that okay. direction. On the other hand, now that you mention it, um, well, how do you do lattice scapes here? Well, I've shown you what the action is. Well, so first of all, what is Euclidean? We've, I've, we've gone through path integrals, so you know that Green's functions or Euclidean time ordered products of fields are ratios of path integrals e to the minus a Euclidean action integrate over all the fields and then you divide by something that turns this thing into a probability distribution. Okay, so this gives you the uh, Euclidean Green's functions. And let me just do it like that. Okay, when we go from that to the lattice gauge theory, we then say that um, anything that we, that, that the probability distribution then is e to the minus the, uh, Euclidean action for a single plaquette um, sum over all the plaquettes of the lattice. And this is a four-dimensional lattice of a lot of plaquettes. And that then is the probability distribution. And then if you want to compute anything, the mean value of anything, so I'll just call A for anything, is sum of A e to the minus that, so it, it, on this, um, on this, well, all right, let me just say A, I won't say exactly what that is, and of course you divide that by sum e to the minus sum over plaquettes as a plaquette, so it's a ratio of sums, and if you do the Metropolis uh, Monte Carlo, then um, uh, what you have simply is a probability distribution. And so P of any uh, configuration is uh, E to the minus is E to the minus S plaquette divided by sum E to the minus S plaquette. So that's your probability. The configuration specifies what? Like what the links are and all that, uh, what all the links are, and consequently what all the plaquette actions are. And um, let me just, for those of you who aren't taking my Monte Carlo tricks course, um, uh, how do you actually do this? What was the trick that was discovered? As far as I'm told, it was discovered by Fermi, but he thought it was too trivial to publish because he was inventing quantum electrodynamics, nuclear physics, and quantum field theory all at once, and, um, and doing experiments. Um, in fact, the, the image that uh, sticks in my mind, which I was told by somebody, it might have been by Flower, um, is that he would sit there at a table, and he'd have be a cyclotron at one end of the room, the beam would be coming across the table, and you'd have a target maybe four or five feet from him, and a counter, and then he'd be working on theory here, and then when the timer would ring, he'd move the, he'd move the counter, and jot down what the result was, re-zero it, and um, 
So between the radiation and the cigarettes, he wound up dying of lung cancer and premature. So did Rebolt for that matter, but Rebolt smoked like a chimney. Um, anyway. Um, so what is the, uh, so, so Fermi invented it, brought it to Los Alamos, and then people at Los Alamos, I think, discovered it independently, Ulan maybe, or Metropolis, I don't know. Anyway, here's the trick. What you do is you say, you want to, uh, you're at a configuration C, and you're asking yourself, should you go to a configuration C prime? And, um, the, all right, so that's the question. If the probability of C prime is greater than the probability of C, then yes. Okay. If the probability of C prime is less than the probability of C, then maybe. In other words, maybe you make this transition. And the condition is you make it with probability. The probability is P of C prime divided by P of C. So this is a number less than one. So what you do is you ask the machine to give you a random number R. If R is less than that, which happens with probability this ratio, you accept, otherwise you reject. And uh, so that's the Trump, that's the way you actually do the Monte Carlo. That's the way you do the lattice simulation. And um, by the way, if you want to play with these sorts of things, um, there is a lattice site uh, that Michael Kreutz, who by the, basically invented the modern lattice gauge theory, because when Wilson formulated his action and did his theory, he didn't know how to implement it on computers. But Kreutz knew about the Metropolis method because his father had worked at Los Alamos. And so he suggested, he wrote a paper showing people how to do it. And he has a website which is lattice guy I think .net, but I'm not absolutely sure. But anyway, just Google Michael Kreutz website. There's some marvelous things there if you're curious about that escape through. You can download some of his C codes, or C++ codes. Okay, now let me um, say something about uh, what the confinement signal is. Well. Suppose you had a, um, a quark and an anti-quark. See, so far we've been talking about just what's called pure QCD, or Grady called it quenched QCD, no fermions. The fermions on a lattice are trouble. Uh, everything is more complicated. And it's, it's, it's at least an order of magnitude part of it, not two orders of magnitude. Anyway, uh, what would a quark-anti-quark pair look like? Well, it would look like a Wilson line. That is to say, you would have something, you would have a quark here, and you would have an anti-quark there, and under a gauge transformation, this would go by U of X, and this would go by U inverse of Y, so effectively, you've got this sort of thing happening. And um, so, so let's see. So what you want then is a Wilson line going, say, from some point x to some other point y, say, in a, in a if we think simply in a spatial direction, say. And then we can imagine that this is the beta direction, or the, you know, 1 over kt direction, the way I think of it. But anyway, in, in a, in a, in a, if you want, you can think Euclidean time direction. Uh, now, 
if you imagine, if you do things in what's called the temporal gauge, the temporal gauge, in some sense, is it's, for a while it was very popular in the when was it very popular in the late seventies it was quite popular. Um, I realize that sounds like um, civil war or something, but. Um, in the late 70s, uh, it was quite popular. The, the gauge condition is A0, A is 0. And you can always make a gauge transformation to the uh, temporal gauge. And of course, everything has to be gauge invariant. So if you have, you're in the temporal gauge, then of course, the, so you have a Wilson line here going from X to Y. If you do a Wilson line this way and you're in the temporal gate, it doesn't count, does it? Because A0 is 0. And so, suppose you want to do, suppose you have then the quark, the quark and the anti-quark at a later time, or a later Euclidean time, then, it, then you've got another Wilson line there. And so in temporal gauge, that's the same thing as just having a huge Wilson loop, all right? And um, now, what you really want to compute is e to the minus, call this distance here t. You want to compute e to the minus th, and then, Kevin. Has a curve cord. Yes. Yeah, I should. All right. Let's. So you have e to the minus th, um, a Wilson loop there, another Wilson loop there, and then say a trace. And um, what does this do? Well, this this Wilson line here. Oh, now I remember, now I, um, I left something out. You can imagine, if you're just looking at things like trace of e to the minus th, you're getting the, all right, let's go over here. If you're just doing e to the minus s d phi without any fields, then you're just looking at things in the vacuum. Okay. But now, if instead you say we've got a, a Wilson line here, well that means you've got the vacuum and the Wilson line. Well now the gauge transformation properties of this are, are those of a quark-antiquark -quark pair. So this thing is like a quark-antiquark -quark pair. And then you have this other one here and that's another quark and a quark pair, e to the minus th. And so if you put in complete sets of states, then you get e to the minus en, e to the minus ten, uh, for what? Well, for the lowest energy state that has these gauge transformation properties. And the idea is that that's the, uh, that's the state of gluons created by the quark-antiquark -quark pair. So that's basically the idea. And, okay, so what do you get? You get e to the minus t, e, n. And now suppose the energy of the quark-antiquark -quark pair was proportional to the distance between them. In other words, a linear potential. Then this, this e of x, y, well, it would just be e to the minus t, y minus x, absolute value. But that's the area. I hope Mr. Quasio was watching. Written down in English word. Um, so, in other words, the uh, in other words, what you do is you do the simulation for a closed Wilson loop, um, e to the minus sum over plaquettes, s plaquette divided by sum plaquettes, uh, 
Uh, you know, yeah, there's no sun here. You know. Well, it is some of the plaquettes, and then. Well, this is some of the configurations and plaquettes, and this is just a particular configuration, some of the plaquettes. Wilson loop. And so you, this is the expected value of this Wilson loop. If this is e to the minus area, then you have a confinement suit. And um, in particular, what you want to show is, a, 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 especially that as the loop gets bigger, the thing falls down as the area. Okay. So it's it's not so much. I mean, you know, any one loose Wilson loop is always going to be e to the minus some area with some coefficient. So the point is that if you do bigger Wilson loops you get uh, the, the thing falls off as the area. And, um, well, it turns out that one gets a very strong e to the minus area signal in all the theories and at strong coupling, including U1. And so that's why I'm not entirely certain that this is uh, really kosher. Um, but, um, People doing lattice gauge theory um, and burning up um, not hundreds of thousands of cray hours per year, but millions of cray hours per year have gotten um, very nice uh, results. On the other hand, I remember a, an MIT professor said to me, um, this is a guy who was not doing lattice gauge. In fact, I think he was a very senior nuclear theorist. He said to me, you know, what bothers me is if you do any Monte Carlo system, you're going to get something of order one. And then you change the coefficient, you change your parameters, you can you know, fit anything. And um, so, and of course, this Wilson, this, this Wigner's, uh, quote, which is, uh, give me five parameters and I can fit an elephant or something. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's, it's what, what probably is true is this, that the lattice gauge theory with Wilson's action and so forth incorporates many of the fact, uh, many of the, many aspects of continuum QCD. And so it should be possible to get results that are approximately true if you're in the right region of parameter space, coupling space, lattice spacing, and so forth. All these various parameters, size of the lattice, uh, value of the coupling, and so forth. And um, so I expect that many of the results um, uh, are true and valid. Um, what's a little bit ambiguous is um, does the uh, is the is the confinement thing uh, valid? And I don't know. And then the problem, of course, with lattice gauge theory is that you know you you start a job running by pressing carriage return, and um, and then several hours later. There are some numbers that come out, possibly with some words, if one is respecting de Blasio's wishes. And, um, and uh, so you don't get a great deal of understanding from these lattice simulations. That's at least so far. Um, and, uh, so that's the problem with numerical stuff as opposed to analytic stuff. Um, I, um, I have a chapter in my book on um, the renormalization group, and I do some of the standard things. And then I do, in one section, I do the condensed matter renormalization group. And then I apply that to QCD. And 
I can get a very robust confinement signal from theoretical arguments without any lattice at all, in fact, without even any character. Um, what, I, what, 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 uh, I showed this to one of the professional lattice people, and he said, well, you're doing that in space rather than, t uh, you're, you're just doing that in space, you're not fooling with the time direction. But of course, confinement is a space business. Um, so I don't know. I'm, maybe you should just send it into a journal. But since I've already published it, of course, it's all right. What I say in the book, though, is that if you do do the same argument in four dimensions, that is, uh, then it doesn't. You don't get the confinement signal. But um, and the difference between the two is you can be stretching the three dimensions of space and not that of time, then you get the signal. If you stretch time and space, it goes away. And, um, oh, I don't know. All right, any questions? All right, why don't we quit? Um, oh, any questions about Grady's talk? Not that I can really necessarily answer them for you, for him, but I can, take a stab at them if they're easy questions. I thought he said that the links were groups, but they were actually group elements. Oh yeah, and each link is a group element. It's of this form. Okay. Well, it's of this form if, well yeah, it's, I mean, it's gotta be in this form because it's a, it's a, an element of SU2 or SU3. And he was doing SU2 on his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. And uh, let, let, let me give you one subtlety here. Um, what you have to do, of course, is you have to basically you go from, you have to go from one U to another U, and you have to do it in such a way that there's no you're not prejudic prejudicing the Monte Carlo simulation. So you have to be have to have a way of thinking about the group, the whole group, as opposed to remember I've been so far gone through the Lie algebra business. But here we're talking about actual group elements, not necessarily near the identity. In fact, that's one of the problems with the Wilson approach is you get you're you're counting group elements far from the identity as uh, and sometimes and sometimes you're not penalized at all for that or not enough yeah. and um, so you need to be able to have what's called an invariant measure on the group and um, I have some notes on that but I all right I'll tell you what the measure is and then maybe at the beginning of next hour I'll, I'll show you um, why it is this. But remember, the, you can say that a, um, a, uh, an SU2 group element can be of this form, 1 minus a squared plus i a dot sigma. I think this is the thing that he was talking about. At least this is the way I would write it. And this is an element of SU2. You can check if that's the case. What is the correct measure on this? Well, the correct measure, you need a uh, something called M of A. And it turns out to be relatively simple. It's 1 minus a, the square root of A squared. And um, it's in my book, but I'll show you maybe in detail next time. All right, so let's, uh, let's quit.